I'm still working at it. So this message didn't just come from a quick week of studying. This message has come from a long time. I want us to understand that in this first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul taught the church about the end times. And he had written to reassure them that, the, that their loved ones who had died would not miss out on the second coming. We've studied that in 1 Thessalonians. Now in 2 Thessalonians, he was answering another question. And this question was that some people had told the church in Thessalonica that Jesus had already come. And Paul wrote to them to assure You say, Pastor Tim, does this ever happen nowadays? Well, I'm glad you asked. Have you ever heard of the Jehovah Witnesses? They are people that will come and knock at your door. Uh, hall here in, in town. There are people that will ask you questions about what they used to ask us, whether we were one of the 144,000. Then when the 144,000 got full, they started asking us other questions about if we were part of God's kingdom. Well, in Jehovah Witness, uh, well, first of all, there, Charles Taze Russell proposed that Jesus Christ was going to return in 1874. When it appeared like Jesus did not return in 1874, he revised his theology and uh, actually just changed his numbers a little bit and came up with the definite word that Jesus was going to return in 1914. And by the time 1914 rolled around, uh, Charles Taylor Russell was no longer the leader of the Jehovah Witnesses, and there was another man, whose name I have temporarily forgotten, who was the new uh, leader of the Jehovah Witnesses. And when 1914 came around, uh, he, he said, oh, I'm not sure what happened here. And then he said, let me think about it for a while. And after a few months, he came up with the answer. Jesus really did return in 1914, according to this teacher in the Jehovah Witnesses, but he returned spiritually and not physically. Therefore, he initiated the kingdom on October 14, 1914. And we are supposed to be part of God's kingdom here on earth, centered in Brooklyn, New York. Well, there are people who are teaching, like Jehovah Witnesses, that Jesus has already come. But the problem with that is people say, wait a minute, I'm left out. I didn't get to see Jesus come. What, what, what about me? Well, that's exactly the issue that Paul was de dealing with here in 2 Thessalonians. And I want to read for you 2 Thessalonians 1 to 12. <clears throat> Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are being gathered to him. We ask you, brothers, guilt or alarm, by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth, 
and destroyed by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance to the work with the work of Satan, of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will be, believe a lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted themselves in wickedness. Lord Jesus, this is a challenging passage of scripture and we ask you that you would give us insight and that you, anything that I speak that is true would uh, be encouraging to our hearts and that we would forget anything that was inaccurate. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In our passage this morning, I, and again I tell you this is not, uh, I'm not the only one that says that, many, uh, many commentators say that. In our passage this morning, Paul gives two requests in verse 1 to 5. The first request is that the church not be disturbed. Concerning two future events. The first future event that he refers to, and I believe that his re reference to these future events is kind of setting the context for the whole passage. The first future event that he refers to is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Greek word parousia. In other words, the coming. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together, how does he say it? And our being gathered together to him. That, I would humbly submit to you, is our understanding of the word rapture. The church is gathered together. And it goes back to what we learned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Oh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you look on this pre-wrath view of the order of end time events that's in your bulletin, Paul in 1 Thessalonians gave us number 3, 4, 5, and 6 of the events that are listed. He told us that the Lord would descend, chapter 4, verse 16. He told us that the dead in Christ will rise first, chapter 4, verse 16. He told us that the remaining would be raptured, caught up to meet Jesus in the air, 4, verse 17. And that the lost would be caught off guard by this event. Jesus would come as a thief in the night, chapter 1, or ch chapter 5, verse 2. And the saved would not be caught off guard, chapter 5, verse 4. Then the sixth event that would happen would be the wrath of God will be poured out, chapter 5, verse 9. So these are the order of events that Paul has already given in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. Now Paul is referring back to something which will happen before the events he has already talked about. So he says, do not be deceived or disturbed concerning the few, two future events, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the rapture of the church are being gathered together with him. Or concerning a recent event that had happened. What was the recent event? Well, we don't know who it was. We don't even know the totality of what they said. But according to Paul in verse 2, there was some prophecy, some verbal report, or some written letter that people said had Pauline authority. So, hey guys, we got this new letter from Paul. Want to read it? Hey guys, we heard these new words from Paul. Do you want to hear what they were? And these were false teachers spreading along around the false news to the church in Thessalonica, and they were a new church. They were kind of 
surprised and wondering, did this really come from Paul? What's this all about? He says, don't be disturbed by some prophecy, verbal report, or, or written letter supposedly coming from us, allegedly, allegedly saying that the day of the Lord has already come. In other words, it's all over, folks. You missed it. He said, don't be disturbed, verse 1 and 2. And then he says, verse 3 to 5, do not be deceived. In other words, Paul believes that there's a possibility that the Thessalonica church, he outlined what must happen before verse 3. Before that day comes, what, what's going to happen? He says, for that day will not come. By the way, do you see the brackets? In the, in the NIV, there's a bracket under the word that and under the word come. Some of your translations might have it in uh, parentheses. Some of them might have italicized. The words that day will not come are actually not found in the Greek text. We have an incomplete sentence in the Greek text. And we have a problem because most likely, but we just don't have those few words. But I want you to know the comparison that we have for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. I want you to see that all of them considered this uh, verse to be incomplete in Greek. Both, all, all of them means the King James the New American Standard Bible, and the NIV. And I want you to see how these different translations translated these quote-unquote missing words. Look at KJV. For, and I have it underlined there, that day shall not come. Do you see that? MESP. For, and this is how they translated it, it will not come. And then the NIV for that day will not come. The only difference between NIV and KJV in this uh, specific area is the difference between the word shall and will. That's it. In other words, three different translation uh, people in different time periods all came up with the same answer that in the context, these four words were what needed to be added. So Paul is saying something important to the church. He is saying that the day that he has talked about in verse 1 and 2, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him will not happen until two things occur. First of all, until the rebellion will occur. In some translations, it's translated the apostasy. It is a time when people who say they are Christians, who have gone to church all their lives, fall away in a great number. You've seen that happen, haven't you? I've seen it happen. Don't you know of people in even in Newman, who used to come to church and now don't go to any church at all. It is beginning to happen. And according to Paul, it will be a, a time when many people will do that. There will be a falling away. Not to say that you lose your salvation, but to say that people who seemingly were part of the church are no longer part of it. They've left. And the, that will happen before the coming of Jesus. And the second thing is the revelation of the man of lawlessness. In other words, the appearance of the Antichrist. Now, let's just hold on here for a minute. There are different ways of understanding this passage. Some people understand the word, the the coming of the Lord in uh, chapter one, ver uh, oh, sorry, chapter two, verse one, in a different way than they understand the coming 
in chapter 2, verse 8. And the different way that they understand it is, they understand that the first reference to the coming of the Lord has to do with uh, the rapture. And the second reference to the coming of the Lord has to do with that which happens after the tribulation, right after the Ar Battle of Armageddon. But I have a hard time separating those two comings within the context of this passage. I see them as being referring to the same thing. In other words, I see Paul telling us that the rebellion and the revelation of the Antichrist will happen before Jesus comes to take us to himself. That means, if you know anything about the end time picture, that I am a I am not a pre-tribber. You've heard of you've heard of the tribulation period, the seven-year period that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, there are some people who believe the seven years of tribulation, and we will not be involved in any of the problems described in the tri tribulation period. But I believe that that is not accurate. I believe that because of this statement of Paul, it's better to say that we will, as a church, go through the first part of the tribulation, <coughs> and that we will only be raptured out of the tribulation when the judgment changes. The first, we see the first part of the tribulation as Satan's wrath against man. And guess what? The church has experienced that all the way through our lives. Uh, all the way. But the, the wrath changes from Satan's wrath against man, the first half of the tribulation, to somewhere in the, in the second half of the tribulation where God's wrath against man comes. And we as a church are not to be subject to God's wrath. Do you know why? Because Jesus took the wrath of God when he died on the cross for us. We are not subject to the wrath of God, therefore we will be caught up to be with Jesus in the air before God's wrath is poured out upon man. The, the pre-tribulation rapture says all of, the, all of the tribulation is God's wrath against man. This, this other view that I'm sharing to you about that I believe is, no, the first part is Satan's wrath against man, and the last part is God's wrath against man. Therefore, I believe in what is called a pre-wrath rapture instead of a pre-tribulation rapture. Does that make sense to you? And because I believe in a pre-wrath rapture, I believe that according to this text, Christians are going to see the Antichrist make a covenant with Israel. Christians are going to see war, famine, and death. And Christians are going to see the time which is called the abomination of desolation when the Antichrist sets himself up as God in the temple and claims to be God himself. And when Christians see this, they will be on the alert. They will know from reading the scriptures, oh, Jesus is coming soon. We don't know the day and hour, but guess what? He's coming really soon. And that's exactly what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. He said that um, for the non-believer, for the non-alert, the wrath of God will happen so fast that it will be like a thief in the night. But he goes on to say, like I've already mentioned, that it's a guard. Because we will know. Ah, we've seen the Antichrist. He's been revealed 
for who he really is. Therefore, Jesus is coming soon. Because we've seen the evidence that it's going to happen. So Paul says, do not be disturbed. Do not be deceived. And he outlines what's going to happen. The rebellion will occur. The revelation of the man of lawlessness will occur. And then he explains in verse 3c to verse 4 what's going to, that man of lawlessness is going to be like. He is destruction. He will oppose everything that is called God. He will exalt himself over God. One day, there is a leader on this earth, and many people will, will respect. But the problem with this man is that he will tell people that he is God, and he will want to accept worship as God knows, wait a minute, if there's a politician that wants every knee to bow and every tongue to confess that he is God, there's a problem with that leader. And that's the kind of leader he will be. He will set himself up in God's temple and he will proclaim to be God. And then he tried to jog their memory in verse 5. When I was with you, didn't I tell you these things? So those were the two requests. Do not be disturbed and do not be... Then Paul talks in verses 6 to 12 about two periods of time. He referred to that which was in the present, verses 6 and 7, and then he refers to that which would be in their future, verse 8 to 12. In their present, verse 6 and 7, they knew what was whole, what or who was holding it, that person of lawlessness back. Look at verse 6. And now you know time. This is already at work, but the one who now holds back, holds it back, will continue to do so until he is... And I grew up in a pre-trib home. I grew up in a pre-trib church. And I heard for many, many times that the one who holds back the man of sin, the lawless one, is, and you probably know it, say it with me, the Holy Spirit. Right? Problem. I don't see that in the text. You don't see the word Holy Spirit in the text. And I say, why? Oh, Tim, you shouldn't ask such difficult questions. But it, it is a difficult question for me. Do you know why? Because in chapter, in the first letter to Thessalonians, Paul talks about the Holy Spirit three times. And he specifically says, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But now it seems like the one who holds back, he is, he is using code language. He is saying, you know what we talked about when we were together. I'm not going to write it down in this letter. The one who holds back. And if it was the Holy Spirit, why? Okay. You've got the question, Pastor Tim. Now what's your answer? Okay, Holy Spirit. I believe that the one who holds back lawlessness is law, law and order. And what was known throughout the Roman world? That the Roman government was one of law and order. And what is known throughout the world today? That all our governments have a responsibility, Romans chapter 13, all of our governments have the responsibility to hold our countries in law and order. But I believe that when the day comes, when the lawless man is revealed, the hand of God on human government will be withdrawn. And just like we saw in the late 80s, we saw the uh, Soviet Union fall apart, I believe that we are going to see 
all the governments of the world fall apart at one time. And that will cause so much chaos that people will demand a leader, even if he claims to be God, they will demand a leader and they will follow him. And that will be the Antichrist. There's one other thing that I want to share to you, and that is a little bit extra. Notice in chapter 2, or chapter 2, verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians, the text is, is written kind of differently in the King James Version. Let me read the King James Version to you of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he is taken out of the way. By the way, this is one verse that gives me a pretty strong argument for why we should not be King James only. The English word let has gone through a massive change in 400 years. The word he that letteth in King James English in 1611 meant he that hinders. But when I hear the word let, I think he that permits. That's how much the English language has changed in 400 years. So if you are a King James only person, let me ask you a question. How are you going to explain this to your, the people? You will say, well, the, the language has changed. So if the language has changed, why don't we need a tr new translation? We do. I am thankful to God for the new translations like the NASB, the NIV, the others that you want to mention, because they help take archaic English language and help us understand them now. So that in my hour of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. That makes sense for me in English. That was extra. So, who is this one who holds back? If you are pre-tribber, you say it's the Holy Spirit. I disagree. I believe it's uh, human government and, and their ability to have law and order, or to keep law and order. So then, verses 8 to 12, he refers to that which would be in their future. He described the coming of the lawless one. What will happen to him? He will be revealed. He will be overthrown by the and he will be destroyed. What will he do? He will do the work of Satan. He will display false miracles, and he will deceive many people. And then he described the judging of the perishing ones, verse 10, b to 12. They will perish because they made a choice. Do you know why people will perish in eternity? Not because God doesn't love them. They will perish because they refused to love the truth. God will present the truth to you. God will make sure that you run up to the truth over and over and over again. But if you refuse to love the truth, God will let you go your own way. That's why people will be destroyed. They will perish because they made a choice. They refused to love the truth. They will perish because God sealed their choice. He will send them a powerful delusion. They will believe a lie and they will be condemned because they have not believed the truth and because they delighted in wickedness. The only thing standing between you and heaven is whether you believe the truth 
or not? And who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He who comes to me will not be rejected. If you come to Jesus, who is the truth, you will be with him in eternity forever. If you reject the truth, if you reject Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will have eternity away from God, and God will actually make it harder for you to change your mind because he will simply seal the, the choice that you've already made. So if you are here this morning and you have any interest in Jesus the truth, come now and don't seal your fate. Let's pray together.